The 1950s were both a decade of American prosperity and increasing fear. The USSR had acquired nuclear weapons and the threat of an all-out war seemed a real possibility. No one wants another Pearl Harbor. This means that we must have knowledge of military forces and preparations around the world, especially those capable of massive surprise attack. How could America best protect its citizens? The answer, seize the high ground and monitor our adversaries from above. Surveillance technologies had advanced significantly during World War II in fields like signals interception, aerial photography, and the new technology on the block known as radar. But sending planes on spy missions was a deadly business. The safer option was obvious. Adapt surveillance technologies for space. But getting there was problematic. And they kept telling them, everybody they were going to put a satellite in orbit. And of course, it never worked. It kept blowing up on the pad. Until 1957, when Russia's Sputnik satellite launch ratcheted up Cold War tensions. And the Sputnik thing really upset people that the Soviets, by demonstrating that they could launch something like Sputnik in 1957, uh, led to uh, many concerns that they may have a significant jump on us. The Cold War escalated even further when Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane was shot down over Russia in May of 1960, ending plane overflights. On display in Moscow, the wreckage of pilot Francis Powers' U-2 reconnaissance plane for Muscovites and foreign newsmen to see. But America was still determined to win the space race and launch the world's first spy satellites. Fortunately, the first signals intelligence, or SIGINT satellite, was mere weeks away. Engineer Reed Mayo had worked on radar detector units for submarines, which were mounted on periscopes. And as he uh, used to phrase it, it was kind of like raising the periscope up to 500 miles, because that was the altitude the satellite was going to fly at. The result was GRAB, launched in June 1960, which collected Russian radar sight signals. It was an unqualified success. It was low cost, it was safe, nobody had to put their life on the line. In a period of uh, weeks, maybe a month or so, learned more about the laydown of the Soviet radar picture than pilots could have ever found. Next up, the harder challenge of gathering IMINT, or imagery intelligence, from space. The project codenamed Corona featured a who's who team of scientific experts to overcome the challenges of acquiring high quality photos from space. And there were a lot of people said, you're not gonna do this, this is a pretty complicated thing. Furthermore, since the images couldn't be transmitted electronically yet, the film had to be physically returned to Earth. The team built heat-resistant buckets equipped with parachutes, which could be dropped from orbit to be caught in mid-air by specially trained pilots. There were many obstacles to overcome. But on August 18, 1960, the NRO's 14th Corona mission successfully collected the first photos of denied Soviet territory from space and returned the film safely. It was amazing. I, I mean, this was a can, one roll of film but it had more information in it than all of the U2 uh, put together. These successes continued, leading to the consolidation of the varied reconnaissance programs into one centralized agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, officially established on September 6th, 1961. That was a very exciting period because um, it looked as though some major things were going to happen. Rounding out space surveillance technologies, the NRO even gathered the world's first radar imagery from orbit in 1964 using a special satellite codenamed QUIL. We had managed to demonstrate that uh, you could build radars, side-looking radars in satellites, and they would work just like they did on the ground. The National Reconnaissance Office had successfully taken SIGINT, IMINT, and radar collections all into outer space. The rest of the 1960s and 70s saw numerous upgrades and improvements. 
Sigint collections improved with Grab and its successor, Poppy. Film collections improved with the high-resolution system Gambit and Hexagon, the wide-area search replacement for Corona. The last piece of the puzzle was to finally make surveillance photography electronically transmittable to Earth. The nation's best engineers worked diligently to increase digital photographic resolution, bandwidth and download speeds, and in 1976 they succeeded. Canon, the world's first high-res electro-optical satellite, made images available to analysts so quickly, the process was called near real time. The greatest game changer was to go to near real time. It allows us to shorten conflicts, it allows us to do precision strike, it limits collateral damage, it limits casualties on our side and the people we're facing because we have a better knowledge, we have a better understanding of the battle space than our opponents do. The 1970s came to a close with the NRO's surveillance satellites generating the highest quality intelligence products on Earth all available faster than ever, allowing timely decisions and quick responses to world events, and of course, helping to keep America safe.